Plaster of Paris is the hemihydrate form of calcium sulfate, meaning that for every molecule of water in the crystalline structure, there are two calcium sulfates. We're used to thinking of hydrates as the number of molecules of water per each of whatever compound, but it doesn't make sense to talk about half a molecule of water, at least not practically. The formula is written with half a molecule of water, and hemi means half, or a famous Mopar engine. In the latter case, it's short for hemisphere, or half a sphere. Anyway, the mineral gypsum is a dihydrate calcium sulfate, which can be partially dehydrated to a hemihydrate in an endothermic reaction. The hemihydrate, which is commonly called plaster of Paris, can in turn be rehydrated in an exothermic reaction, which will be the main reaction in this video. Interestingly, the endothermic dehydration reaction is what gives gypsum its most prolific use, that of drywall in construction. In case of fire, the heat energy is spent on dehydrating the calcium sulfate, which slows the spread of the fire. Before we start, though, I have to make sure I have enough plaster of Paris to get through this video. Yeah, I think I'll be alright. For reasons I can no longer explain, or perhaps never could, I decided to buy 25 pounds of plaster of Paris back in the year 2000, and for 19 years, there it has sat. I think I used it once or twice to cast animal tracks in my backyard, but that was about it. I'll use quite a bit today, though. If you've been following along, I recently finished cleaning out my chemical storage. Well, now I have completely cleaned out the whole lab and made a complete inventory so I can use what I have and avoid buying supplies I don't need since I already have them. So in this video, I'll be using up some of these old supplies. Here are some cups from the mid-1990s then a package of party bowls from, I'd guess, the early 2000s, and then a couple of plastic spoons that, yes, used to be white. These little paper cups will be the forms we use to make roughly equal volumes of plaster, which is going to be important because one of the experiments I'm going to try involves manipulating the density. For density, we need to know mass per volume, and if all the volumes are essentially the same, life gets easier. Filled to the brim, those little cups are just under 100 milliliters, so the standard volume is going to be 98 milliliters. The party bowls can hold 12 ounces, meaning we can fit about four volumes of those paper cups in this bowl. They're disposable too, making them the perfect mixing vessel. So let's start by mixing up a batch of plaster of Paris the way you're supposed to. That is, two parts of dry plaster and one part water, by volume. I'm using the Dixie cup to measure the dry ingredient, but they, strangely enough, don't hold up well to water, so I'll use a beaker to add just under 100 milliliters of water to the powder. Note the dust when I mix them together. I'm wearing a dust mask, and I highly recommend you do the same if you're working with plaster. It's not particularly toxic, but remember, when this stuff gets wet, it hardens to stone, and the inside of your lungs are wet. So anyway, I have three cups accounting for the full volume of the powder and water, and I'm going to make these control casts so we can see the properties and density of the proper mix of plaster. However, it seems I didn't account for all the air mixed into the powder, and I'm coming up a little short on volume. Because I want more than one control, I'm going to mix up another batch and fill three full cups. While I do that, here's the plan. These three salts were specifically listed as additives that will accelerate the hardening process. I'm adjusting the volumes to three parts plaster and one and a half parts water, but since I don't want to mess with eighths of a teaspoon, I'm going to fill the quarter teaspoon just a little bit extra. I'm also going to try tinting the plaster, but that's really just for fun. So I'll keep the two to one proportion and add a teaspoon or so of iron oxide to the mix. Since it's just going to find its way into the structure, I shouldn't have to adjust the proportions for the plaster. Then finally, I'm gonna add foam to the plaster. 
I found this procedure online, and I'll link to it in the description, mostly because I recommend the author's science jokes page, but only if you're serious about being a nerd. They're bad jokes. Anyway, this is the one that's supposed to change the density of the plaster. I'm not really sure how that's going to work, but we'll find out. And just to make sure it's not the addition of extra liquid that's causing the change in density, I'll add twice and thrice the amount of water to see what happens. Okay, here are the three control casts, and into the last one that I poured, I'm going to add a thermometer. It starts at about 22 and a half degrees, but within about half an hour, it's up to 35 degrees, and it slowly starts dropping at that point. As you can see, it's also rock hard after half an hour. All right, moving on to the next trial, we have three parts of plaster of Paris and a little bit better than a quarter teaspoon of sodium chloride. I'm adding 150 milliliters of water, which just barely fits in the little bowl, and then I'll stir it carefully to avoid splashing everywhere. As I stir it in, I can tell that it does seem to be setting up a little bit faster than the first one. This is going to give me two full samples and one partial. I'll add the thermometer to the partial cups as I go along. There was already some resistance after about five minutes when I stuck the thermometer in, and the temperature was already 26 degrees. That's much higher than the control in the same amount of time. The getting hotter faster trend continued. At 10 minutes it was over 31 degrees, and by the 20 minute mark it was up to 39.8. The control topped out at 35. The next batch was essentially the same as the previous, except instead of sodium chloride I used potassium sulfate. This batch set up very quickly, and within two to three minutes it was already resisting a finger squeeze. In as little as five minutes, it had already gone up to 30 degrees C, and it was hard. By 10 minutes, it was over 40 degrees C. The setting time isn't the only change to the reaction. It's interesting to see a catalyst in action, and serves to remind us that kinetics and thermodynamics are intimately related. The last of the salt additives is aluminum potassium sulfate. This batch was almost opposite of the potassium sulfate. While I was mixing it, it felt as though it was setting up quickly, but when I put the thermometer in there, it couldn't hold it upright. It stayed soupy for quite a while, and actually seemed to retard rather than accelerate the setting process. The temperature went up a lot slower as well. It was only 28.5 degrees after 10 minutes, but was reasonably hard by then as well. It topped out at about 37 degrees before it started falling. Next, I'm going to mix up a batch with iron oxide. I have this very old bottle from, oh, 1995. What I like most about this trial was the uneven mixing. I'm sure I could have done better, but I quite like the swirl pattern. Since I kept the original proportion of 2 to 1, I'm only going to get a cup and a half. My iron oxide is more of a brown color, but I have some redder iron oxide in my store stock, so I made a batch with that too. This empty bottle is critical to the next set of trials. How, you might ask? Well, I'm going to put some soap and water in there and then shake it up. Then, mix the suds with the plaster. Yeah, I have my doubts too. Here we go anyway, for the sake of learning and discovery. I've got the empty bottle, which can hold 500 milliliters of liquid, and I'm going to add 5 milliliters of soap and 95 milliliters of water to the bottle. Rinsing out the soap is probably overkill, but it was actually necessary with the shampoo I use later on. Anyway, this is going to be a 5% soap solution by volume. Next step, I'm going to shake the heck out of it. And as you can see, very quickly, the volume of blue colored water at the bottom is reduced significantly. All that liquid is being suspended, if you will, in the foam. Now that we have our foam, let's mix up a batch of plaster. 
I'm not sure why I've switched to a popsicle stick, but don't worry, the nasty old spoon will be back later. Now that the plaster is mixed, I'm going to make sure the soap solution is well shaken and then pour out three cups worth of foam into the plaster, then stir. Perhaps not surprisingly, the foam stays on the surface. Going back to the nasty spoon, however, you can see that when I dig out some plaster from the bottom, the foam and plaster are pretty much one and the same at this point. So let's pour the cups and see what happens. Better yet, the first cup I scoop out the plaster from the bottom rather than dump it all over the place. I'm going to repeat the same procedure with anti-dandruff shampoo, which is supposed to work a real treat, but I didn't film it because I was running out of room for the camera. And in case you're wondering, the newest item used in making this video was the potassium sulfate from 2012, but the shampoo was next newest from about 2007. I don't use that brand, and I have to admit that the smell brought back lots of memories. I'm not sure if they were good or bad though. I also mixed up a batch with twice the amount of water to see if we could see a difference in density if there was just less plaster in the final mix. That middle cup is too full, but I won't know that until I dump it all over the floor when I move it. After this, I did a three times as much water trial as well. Okay, here are all the samples I've made today. I'm going to leave them for about 48 hours to dry up and cure completely. In the meantime, I've got to figure out what to do with all the rest of that plaster. In just the making of this video, I used about 1.9 kilograms of plaster, and I still have all of this left. And I'm pretty much over it. I've had this bucket eating up all sorts of space for the last 19 years, and I'd like to change that. Now I realize that there's a chance that as soon as I get rid of this, I'll wish I still had it. But I'm willing to take that chance. I can always get more. My main business is selling chemicals to educational and amateur labs, so I know a thing or two about repackaging bulk chemicals. We also recycle chemicals that our clients no longer use, but that the chemicals themselves are still usable. So I've decided to combine the two. I've taken a quart-sized bottle and found that it holds 750 grams of dry plaster. So, I'm repackaging this big bucket of plaster into 750 gram bottles, and I will be offering them for sale while supplies last. Each bottle purchased will contribute to the production of these videos. So you too can try your hand at casting plaster with colorants, foam, or what have you. Maybe you can see if other salts might work better or worse than the three I've tried here. Or just take a cast of your dog's paw print in the dirt by your house. But you'll be one of the few who uses House Lab branded calcium sulfate. But please, wear a dust mask and don't dump a bunch down the drain. Lungs and plumbing are two places where plaster's no good. It's easy to order. Just go to libertysci.com. That's libertysci.com and click on the House Lab category. The price includes shipping anywhere in the continental United States, and whatever's left after that will go directly to this channel. Feel free to browse the catalog while you're there. So here we are a few days later, and I'm going through weighing everything. I recorded the mass of each, less the cups, and then calculated the density based on a 98 milliliter volume. Some are a little more, some are a little less. The shampoo trial was the hardest on the little cups, and I had to double them up. They, they were just falling apart. I'm pleased to tell you that I was able to use up all of those little paper cups in this. The lab cleanup continues. Here are the raw data. I didn't bother with averages or anything, mostly because there are only enough data points in three categories for an average. The densities are green, and there's a clear division of greater than one and less than one. Because of that, we can have a little fun. 
Since the cups are only 2 grams each, they won't affect the overall density enough to change the results, and I can leave them on. As we can see, the control and two of the salts sink like the rocks that they are. I can't tell you why the alum isn't there. I, I think I just forgot about it. And also note that the bubbles are just pockets of air that are in the cast. There's no chemical reaction happening. Now we can have some real fun. The three varieties of foam, two dish liquids and one shampoo, all float to varying degrees, which is also interesting. They also tell you how and in what direction my house is unlevel. Let's have a look inside, shall we? The cup peels off nicely, except for the bottom, which gets annoying fast. Anyway, the control is quite solid all the way through, as expected. But if you look at the foam one, first of all, there's a clear separation of the foamy plaster and solid plaster, which explains why this one appeared to be more dense in the water. It was acting like a hydrometer, really. As I go through each of the others, there is a density gradient in each of them, with the bottom layer being almost completely plaster, and the top being a very fragile layer of very low density plaster. This would have been more interesting, perhaps, using clear cups. I wanted to see a better cross section, and this rickety old knife I rediscovered in the lab should help with that. Once I finally get it open, you can see even more clearly how uneven the plaster, and thus density, is distributed. With the second one, just look at how easily the knife cuts through the top and how difficult it is to get through the bottom. Impossible, in fact. Not to mention that my knife skills should not be duplicated. It's a miracle I still have all my fingers after this. Eventually, I just got kind of destructive and... Yeah, maybe it's best to move on now. The rust-colored samples turned out really nice. I like the swirls a lot. The one on the left is with my brown iron oxide, while the one on the right is made with the iron oxide from libertyside.com. Now, that's as of this being published. There are varieties and natural differences with iron oxide, so the next batch of bulk might be a slightly different color, or really different. Let's not forget about the extra water trials. This is the two times extra water, and basically what happened was the plaster settled to the bottom and the extra water went topside and just evaporated. So if you were to take this as 98 milliliters, it would have a density lower than the control, but the density of the part that is solid is essentially the same as the density of the control. With three times the water, the effect was the same, but liquid water remains even after two days. What's more, the plaster layer never fully cured either. It's still mushy, especially at the top. But again, if we were to calculate the density based on 98 milliliters, this would be about half as dense as the control, because there's half as much plaster in there. A higher ratio of water doesn't truly affect the density like the foam, but settling makes the foam results unpredictable and impractical, unless there was a way to suspend the plaster in the foam better. Well, I have to admit, that was a lot more fun than I expected out of plaster. But now, on to different things. Let's see what we get to play with next time. Uh-oh. Oh, just dive in. Last man standing. Fructose. Thanks a lot for watching, and I'll see you next time.